Good morning, Parkview, and happy Father's Day. Will you stand and worship with us this morning? Oh, precious. Singing, oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow.
is Father's Day, and I thank you that um, not only can we celebrate our earthly fathers, but I thank you that we can celebrate you and your goodness to us. I thank you for your unconditional love, that you love us so deeply despite our faults and our unfaithfulness to you, Lord. I thank you that you are faithful to us. Um, I pray that you'd open our hearts to receive your love and whatever word you have for us today, and I ask these things in your name. Amen. You may be seated. Happy Father's Day, everybody. I guess just the fathers, right? Happy Father's Day. Um, for your present today, I think I've done this the last three years, I've given the fathers a Father's Day joke to tell. I, there's people looking forward to this. Good, good. This is good. All right, so here you go. Are you ready? Everyone must laugh because it's Father's Day. Why do cow milking stools only have three legs? Because the cow has the udder. There you go. That's a good one. That's your present. Oh, your other present is, fathers, we have a candy bar out there for you as well. Maybe your father, maybe your father was great. Maybe your father was a dope. I know some kids across the, the way that their dad tells dad jokes all the time that are awful. And, you know, we dads can be weird. We can be not always the greatest listeners in the world. We can sometimes be a little insensitive, maybe a little harsh. Maybe you had a father that was never there. Maybe you had a father that was great. But here's the thing. Every earthly father is flawed. And I think that we have a tendency when we hear that we have a heavenly father to project our earthly fathers onto the heavenly father. And we should never do that. Because our heavenly father is the father that we always wanted. The father that I hope to be, but I know I can't be. But our heavenly father, our heavenly father loved us so much and this is what I want us to consider during communion. Our Heavenly Father loved us so much that He adopted us by sending His Son to this earth to die for us so that we could be reconciled with Him. It says in Romans 8, 15, The Spirit you receive does not make you slaves that you live in fear again. Rather, the Spirit you received brought about your adoption to sonship. sonship. And by him, we cry, Abba. We cry, Daddy. Because he is the father that we long for. He is the father that our heart desires. So as we take communion, let's recognize the fact of how wonderful our Heavenly Father is. Dear Heavenly Father, first I want to apologize for projecting the sins and the, the mess-ups and the, the, the dopiness of earthly fathers onto you because I know you're the perfect father. And thank you for loving me perfectly. And as I take communion now, help me to remember that you love me so much you sent Jesus to die for us. It's in your son's name we pray. Amen.
Today we have the privilege, Travis Roberta, you come up here, to have Travis Roberta Sanders come and speak to you just a little bit briefly about Casas Per Cristo down in, well, El Paso is where they're at right now. But uh, we support them as missionaries. They're great friends of ours and kind of related to the church in other ways, too. So, uh, um, so many lives have been changed because of this ministry. So, oh, I'm going to pray for them. Here we go. Dear Heavenly Father, uh, thank you for Travis and Roberta. I thank you for their work that they do down in um, El Paso. Thank you for the houses they build to bless the families down there and how much of an impact that makes on the families and also how much of an impact it makes on the people building the houses. God, I ask that you continue to bless their ministry. And it's in your son's name we pray. Amen. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Thank you. And so, like Brian mentioned, um, we've had the privilege of working with Casa Por Cristo for roughly, uh, I guess, the last 14 years. Um, and so I would be remiss if I did not first and foremost mention a big thank you to you guys. Um, we get to be there doing what we do um, because of the love and support uh, you guys have poured into us uh, for a very long time. So thank you so much for that. Um, if any of you need a refresher, Casas Por Cristo is Spanish for houses because of Christ. Um, and so that's what we do. We try to use a home building um, gift as an example of what it looks like to receive God's grace. Um, the families we serve, they, uh, they try to survive on about $2 to $8 per day. Um, for a family of, I would say, roughly average five people. Um, and so that's very difficult. It's, um, it's hard to get past the uh, worries of the daily struggle. Um, and so we want to come in, help them to, uh, to just knock one thing off of that list um, and give it to them in, in the eyes of what it looks like, of what Christ has done for us. Um, as many of you know, 2020 was tough. Um, it was no different for us at Casas, and so Roberta's going to share a little bit more about that. Thanks. Um, so good morning, everybody. I want to share a verse first off. Um, this is a verse that's been a big encouragement to us at Casas over the last year and a half. Hopefully it will be an encouragement to you because I'm sure you all have gone through your own share of challenges due to COVID and everything else going on right now. So um, this is 2 Corinthians 4, 16 to 18. Therefore, we do not lose heart, though outwardly we are wasting away, yet inwardly we are being renewed day by day. For our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. So we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but on what is unseen, since what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal." Um, so that's a verse that we've just been reciting back and forth to each other um, to encourage each other in our um, as a staff over the last year and a half because we have had a lot of challenges, um, a lot of scary moments. Um, when COVID happened, uh, a lot of our teams called us over the course of a few days and said, we can't come on our trips this year. Um, and I don't know if you remember, COVID kind of began at the beginning of March. March is our busiest month of the year, followed by June, and almost all of our March teams had to cancel their trips. Um, so that was pretty scary for us. We weren't sure if we would even be able to keep our doors open or, you know, still be able to pay for health insurance for our missionaries and things like that. So it was a little bit rough. Um, and then on top of that, this year, materials prices of building materials has shot up through the roof. So that was the second challenge that we've had to face this year. <laughs> Sorry for the disco light. <laughs> Um, so anyway, we've had our fair share of challenges over the last year, but let me tell you what. Um, in 2019, we built 289 houses. That was a typical year for us. We were hoping to do the same the next year in 2020. Obviously, COVID stopped that, but we were still able to build 185 homes last year, which I think is pretty amazing, all things considered. Yeah. Um, so the way God like opened a door for that to happen was he allowed us to launch a new program at CASAS called Hope Restored. And what that program was was just a way for our teams who had to cancel, um, a way for them to still give the funds for a house to be built. And then our missionaries that live in each of the locations, along with some local volunteers, 
went and did the physical labor to build those homes. So over half of the 185 homes last year were built through our Hope Restored program. And we have a bunch of them still this year that are being built through that program. So it wasn't the way we intended to do ministry. Obviously, we miss having our teams come and build and serve with us because that's a big part of what we do is not just ministering to the families, but also seeing volunteers come and step out in faith and see them grow. So wasn't what we anticipated, but God still allowed us to build 185 homes to for 185 families and to share his love with those people um, through, through the ministry. So we're really grateful that we were able to still we're, that we're able to still be in existence, really, because um, it was a little a little touch and go there. So I just want to say thank you guys for being a part of what we do. We appreciate you so much. Thanks for being behind us and coming on trips with us. Um, I don't know when the next Parkview trip will be, probably next year or something. So if you have a chance, please come build and serve with us. We would love to get the opportunity to do that with you. So thank you guys. Happy Father's Day. Good morning. You can hear me now, right? That's good. I got to tell you, we had a, a really good first service, nicer people early. <laughs> just, just kidding. You'll get used to me. No, we had a great first service because uh, Chase Kleinschmidt was baptized into Christ this morning. He's the eight-year-old son of the Kleinschmidt. So yeah, very, very cool. On Father's Day, and Dad got to baptize him, and that's, that's pretty good. So we're, we're thrilled about that. Hey, I want to say hello to the kids. Next week, we should have Kids Church back in the gym. We should have the floor ready to go. You'll be back there. So just thanks for putting up with us today. And uh, you're going to love big church. <laughs> I think. Uh, at least I hope you do. Father's Day is one of my favorite holidays. Pretty low-key event, really, for most of us. I'm, the series of sermons I'm preaching is called Relational Vampires. It has nothing to do with Father's Day. Okay, so just breathe easy. We're not worried about fathers too much. Just Relational Vampires. That is loving the people who suck the life out of you. Not abiding them, but loving them. John chapter 13, verse 34. Here are the words of Jesus. I'm giving you a new commandment. Love each other. That's not new. But just as I have loved you, that's the new part. You should love each other. Your love for one another will prove to the world you're my disciples. So we, we talked about controllers last week. We're going to talk about hypocrites and inconsistent people. Today we're going to talk about critics. As I've been preparing this series of sermons, I've realized I am a vampire. Anybody else? I've, boom, boom, boom. I, I probably cover most of those. Critics. You might be a critic. Anybody want to admit to being a critic? If you've been in church this morning and you've leaned over somebody five times already and said, I don't, I don't know why they're doing that. I don't, like, I don't like the fact the gym's closed. I don't know what to paint those walls black for. The music is too loud, too soft, too fast, too slow. The sermons are too short, too short, too short. I hear that all the time. The sermons are way too short. Anybody? anybody? Yeah. I don't know why I didn't preach a little longer. If, you, if you've been criticized since you got in, you probably are a critic. Anybody have in your life somebody who has the gift of criticism? I mean, they have like the spiritual gift of criticism, and they're able to point out all your flaws? Could be a boss. Anybody got a boss? And as long as you do everything, everything's fine, the boss is quiet. But the moment something goes awry, the boss wants to talk. That boss is a critic. Maybe, maybe your parents are critics. I don't know why you're raising your kids like that. Don't know why you're spending your money like that. Ever, anybody got any critics? <laughs> well, they're all around, believe me. Maybe somebody says, uh, why are you going back to school? Or why aren't you going back to school? Why are you homeschooling your children? Why aren't you homeschooling your children? And on and on, the critics are there. Anybody got a critic in your life? <laughs> Very good. Uh, Abraham Lincoln said this, any fool can criticize and most fools do. So I wanna, what I want to do today from the Bible, I want to give you five strategies. Think about your critic, five strategies for dealing with your critic. Number one and criticism. Number one is expect criticism. Don't be surprised when people criticize you. This is normal. John chapter 12. Let me read a little section of the, the gospel of John for you. So six days before Passover, this is when Jesus is going to die. Uh, Jesus arrived in Bethany at the home of Lazarus, the man he had raised from the dead. A dinner was prepared in Jesus' honor. Martha, that's Lazarus' sister, served 
and Lazarus among those who ate with him. Then Mary, that's another sister of Lazarus, whose brother had just been raised, took a 12-ounce jar of expensive perfume made from the essence of nard. She anointed Jesus' feet with it, wiping his feet with her hair, and the house was filled with the fragrance. Now, we've talked about this story before, but she busts a big jar of perfume, puts it on Jesus, and then wipes his feet with her hair. Ladies? Ladies? And that's a little wild, don't you think? And in the midst of all this, Judas, verse 4, Judas the critic, the disciple who would soon betray him said, this perfume was worth a year's wages, should have been sold in the money given to the poor. Why criticize? Well, he was thinking he would rather have the, the perfume stay on the shelf rather than be poured out on Jesus' feet. Jesus is high profile. And this is an emotional thing. It's tied to money. And it's an exuberant act of worship. You ever look at somebody in worship and go, calm down? Ever look at somebody going, just, you know, we, you've been to church before, just calm yourself. That's kind of what Judas is saying about Mary. I mean, hey, we've been around Jesus, but calm down. You don't need to pour that much perfume and certainly not wipe his feet with your hair. It's too much. Have you ever been criticized for being too exuberant in worship? Maybe, maybe somebody criticized you when you gave your life to Christ and you were baptized into Christ. You know, you said, I'm, I'm, I'm going all in for Jesus. I'm going to be buried in the water, rise to walk a new life. And somebody said, I don't, I don't think you, you don't have to go that far. Or maybe it's when you took a mission trip. You went to Mexico or you went to uh, Taiwan or somewhere. And, you, you, and somebody said, I don't think you need to do that. I mean, you're, you're, you're going too far. Do we, do we really need a ladies' night? I mean, we're having church. Right? We're going to talk about ladies' nights coming up in a little bit. I mean, what? And men's night coming up. We really need to do all these things. And maybe you put a thousand bucks on a gym and somebody said, I don't know, that's, that's a, a little, bit, little bit wild. Don't need to do that. People are critical. One preacher keeps a file of critical letters he receives. I do not. You'd be well glad to know. Here's one of those critical letters. I like this. She, a lady writes, this is the most abominable church I've ever seen. It breaks my heart. You lead so many young people away from God. You should be ashamed of yourselves. You call yourselves Christians? I doubt you even know who Christ is. I will never come to the Satan's den again. In Christ's love, Laura. <laughs> Thank you, Laura. <clears throat> Not only was Judas criticizing Mary, and he was criticizing her, he really was criticizing Jesus for allowing this to happen. And Jesus frequently received some criticism. So when you get criticized, Jesus was perfect, and he was criticized. His brother said to him one time, if you want to be a big deal, and you obviously do, then why don't you go down to Jerusalem where everybody can see you? Why, what do you know up here in God? And they're criticizing him. Jesus went to church one Sabbath day to the synagogue, and there was a sick person there. He healed the sick person, and the critics said, well, why, why would you heal on the Sabbath day? I mean, there are six days to work. Take the day off. He was constantly criticized. When he cast out a demon, they said he only does it because he's in league with Satan. He, he's part of Satan's team. That's what's going on. Why don't you make your disciples fast? Why, why don't, over and over again, they, they criticized Jesus. So if he was criticized, does this help you at all? You can expect it. You're going to be criticized. Here's a second idea. Understand the motives behind the criticism. Not every criticism you receive has to do with you. Verse 6 of John 12, after Judas makes a criticism, a little footnote says, not that Judas cared for the poor. He was a thief, and he was in charge of the disciples' money. He often stole some for himself. And so sometimes when people criticize you, it's not about you. They're trying to cover up their own mess. Ever notice that? Let me give you an example. Now, and, and you're going to love this example. Are you ready? Sometimes we've taken a trip to Mexico, and somebody has said to me, why would you go to help poor people in Mexico? We've got a lot of poor people here. True. We do. Should we help poor people here? Listen, it's going to take a long time unless you get with me. <laughs> should we help poor people here? Of course. Of course we should. Should we help poor people in Mexico? Sure. And sometimes I wonder when somebody says, why do you help poor people here? Or why, don't you, why are you going to Mexico and you could do this here? I think sometimes what they're really trying to cover up is the problem that, that they're not doing anything for the poor. And they, they would like me to do it, follow their agenda. <laughs> and sometimes, that, sometimes that, that criticism is genuine. Sometimes it's just a cover-up for the fact that I don't want to do anything. Maybe I've said too much. Let me give you another one. Some people are critical because they're wounded. I've, you ever notice this? You, you get a dog, 
And you, that dog loves you. But if that dog is hurt, you got to be careful. Because uh, hurt people hurt people. You, you know what I'm talking about? When you're wounded, when you're tender, and somebody punches you in a tender spot, you're, you're liable to lash back. So some people criticize you. It, it's nothing to do with you. It's the fact that they're hurt. Several times I've heard people say, they have a, a young person grows up in church, and then they get to be whatever age, and they begin to go a different direction. They're not following Jesus anymore, and their life falls apart, and things are terrible. And by the way, when that happens, you have my condolences. I'm so sorry. I can't imagine anything really worse than that. That would be about the worst thing that could possibly happen. And when that happens, sometimes those parents will make critical remarks about the church. The church didn't really help my kid. Many times I happen to know that the church was very involved and tried really hard. But I understand if you've got problems, you're liable to lash out. And so sometimes people are critical because they're wounded. Sometimes they're covering up. Sometimes they're just jealous. A lot of the criticism Jesus received was because the Jewish leaders were jealous of him. They, in fact, Pilate said, I know they've handed you over to me because they're envious of you. Sometimes people are critical just because they have a bad habit. And they're critical of everybody. Proverbs 12, 18. Some people make cutting remarks, but the words of the wise bring healing. We have critics for everything. We have movie critics. We have political critics, we have sports critics, and somehow we think that to be sophisticated, you've got to criticize. And if you're a cheerleader, you must be simple-minded, and so we naturally fall into this critical way of thinking and, and talking. Be careful. The Bible says your words are supposed to encourage other people. So think about it. Are the words you speak, do they encourage people or they, do they discourage? I would say that if 80% of what you say is negative... You're really a discourager. Can I tell you that if 80% of what you say is positive and 20% is negative, you're very much a discouraging person to be around. I don't know if you realize that or not. Unless you, 90 or 95% of what you say is positive, you're a discourager. Am I, am I saying too much? You, we need people who will pat us on. And we need some correction. I'm not saying we don't need correction. But if, hey, dad, hey, coach, hey, boss, if the only time you speak is when you got something you don't like, eh, then you're being a negative influence, and you have joined this course of people who make cutting remarks. I have uh, very little social media contact. You, you know that. The only social media I'm really on is Snapchat. Anybody shocked? <laughs> what are you doing with Snapchat? I have grandchildren who don't live close to me. And every day, I get pictures of the grandkids doing something cute. In fact, I could show you the pictures, but you don't care. And I don't blame you. That's all fine. Occasionally, I make Snapchat. I, I make Snapchat this way. Julie takes a candid camera video of me and posts it on Snapchat. Now, if she will tell me, I'm taking your photo right now, I'm making a video of you, then I would act better. <laughs> but since it's candid, I don't always. And sometimes she'll send a Snapchat, and I'll go, you know, let's do a retake on that one. Now that I know the camera's rolling, I think I could. And what I really hate is sometimes in the Snapchats, I don't seem happy. And I seem critical. It must just be the camera. <laughs> no, it's not the camera. The fact is, sometimes I, <clears throat> it's the mouth. And I need to be careful because I do not want to be a discourage, discouragement to other people. We can do that. We, we say things like, can you believe the way she dresses? I mean, I just can't understand why, why. Why does anybody need a house that big? What were they thinking? And we just, we just say it. We, I heard about one lady who was a, a wife, and she was so critical of her husband. She just criticized all the time. Finally, somebody invited her to go to church, and she went to church. And a couple months later, she began to hear the gospel. Her heart opened up, and she became a follower of Jesus, pledged her life to Christ, was baptized into him. It's all good. Her husband, somebody asked him a couple, weeks, a couple months later, how's that going? She, he said, it's great. I don't mind her being born again. But she's still so critical, did she have to come back as the same woman? Well, I might own some of that. Some critics uh, criticize just because they're selfish and spoiled. We are so spoiled. Everybody with me? Together. We are so spoiled. In the back, one more time. We are so spoiled. We go to a restaurant. Somebody else cooks the food. Somebody else puts it on my plate, hands me a fork, and says, eat. 
and I eat, and there's too much salt on one of the items, and I'm, I'm, a, I'm an unhappy man. We are together. We are so spoiled. And along with being so spoiled, we are so selfish that when things don't go exactly the way I prefer them to go, I am very critical of other people. <laughs> That's part of what Judah's problem was. It wasn't that she gave the money to Jesus. The, money, the problem was he didn't get the money, and he was, was pretty selfish. Here's the last thing you need to understand about critics. Some people criticize you because they want to help you. How about that? Ecclesiastes chapter 7, verse 5. Better to be criticized by a wise person than to be praised by a fool. We need people who will tell us the truth. Hey, by the way, you have something stuck in your teeth. It would be good to get that out before you go back to work. Okay. Yeah, maybe that's not the best look for you. Maybe other clothes would be more appropriate. You know, we, we need people like that. We don't really appreciate them. Expect criticism, understand it. And then here's number three. Please get this. Third strategy, profit from criticism. Profit from criticism. I don't like critics. I don't like to be criticized. But every criticism that's ever come my way has at least a gold nugget in it. There's at least some little bit, some grain of truth I could profit from. And often, it's told in such a harsh way that I miss the grain of truth. But there usually is something there that I could learn from. It takes wisdom and maturity to learn from criticism. Let me give you a couple of Proverbs Solomon collected, 13, 18. If you ignore criticism, you'll end in poverty and disgrace. If you accept correction, you'll be honored. Chapter 15, verse 31. If you listen to constructive criticism, you'll be at home among the wise. If you reject discipline, you only harm yourself. If you listen to correction, you grow in understanding. So go to school. Chapter 25, verse 12. I love this one. To one who listens, valid criticism is like gold earring or other gold jewelry. I can't afford gold jewelry, but I can afford to criticize. Hello? And it's better, a good word of criticism, better than, than gold jewelry. 29.1. Whoever stubbornly refuses to accept criticism will suddenly be destroyed beyond recovery. Now, it's no fun to be criticized. I don't want any more. Thank you very much. But I, when, I, when I am criticized, criticized, I want to learn from it. And in fact, I'm going to encourage you, decide when I'm criticized, I'm going to profit from this. I'm going to, I'm going to get something out of this. About four years ago, I went to preach on a Sunday night over a little church called Little Grove a Christian Church. On the railroad tracks outside of Walnut Hill, just south of Centralia, a little bit east of Centralia. A friend of mine preaches there, and they had, they've been having guest guys come in uh, for the summertime once a month. And I got to be one of those. It was a good time, good singing, lively people, friendly people. We ate a little bit, and they let me preach. And I took a sermon I was pretty comfortable with. Okay. This is the first time I preached this sermon, a little harder. But it was one I preached several times. I, I felt good about it, and I went over it. We had a nice time. And on the way out, we were going, you know, they shake, preachers shake them out of church. They were all high-fiving, wonderful sermon, best ever, you know, that kind of thing. Actually, I thought it was pretty good. I, I can usually tell. I thought that went pretty good. One guy, about 75 years old, came out. He's actually a person I happen to know. Shook my hand. He said, you know, you have a nervous habit when you preach. No, I have about 30 of those. And he pointed out one of those habits, and I'm not telling you which one. <laughs> Absolutely not ever going to tell you what he said. But he pointed out a nervous habit, and he said, you know you did that in a 30-minute sermon. You did that 64 times. I said, well, I'm glad you enjoyed the sermon. I'm glad you got a lot out of that. I, I honestly, um, I, do, I wasn't very happy about that. I, mean, I, I didn't feel, well, that's a great gift you've given me. But I have watched a few videos. I don't think 64 is a high number. <laughs> Probably beat that all the time. I will say this. After he gave me that golden nugget of goodness, he's a nice guy. He just happened to be distracted by me. After he gave me that golden nugget of goodness, I have tried very hard to limit that habit. Uh, he did me some good. I, I want to profit by it. So I don't want any more criticism. If I have to have it, I sure hope to learn from it. Here's the number four strategy. Respond to criticism if necessary. You don't have to respond to every critic. You don't have to respond. In fact, 
when you're criticized, your emotions are high. When your emotions are high, your wisdom is low. Shut your mouth. Okay? Because when your emotions are high, you're going to open your mouth, and you're not going to like what Later on, you go, but that wasn't very good. And so you don't have to respond to every criticism. Jesus did not respond to every criticism. Did you know that? They, they criticized him. And sometimes he's, for instance, they said, by what authority do you do the things you're doing? And Jesus said, uh, you know what, that's a good question. If you tell me about what authority John acted, then I'll answer your question. Oh, they're afraid to answer Jesus' question. He didn't have to answer theirs. He just refused to answer. Before the, the council, the Jewish council, they brought these crazy charges against Jesus. You know what Jesus said in reply? Nothing. Okay. Sometimes the charges are crazy. You don't have to reply. Sometimes Jesus did reply, and sometimes you need to reply as well. In Proverbs 19.11, he says this. Sensible people control their temper. They earn respect by overlooking wrongs. It doesn't mean they don't profit from it. They just don't have to respond. But sometimes Jesus did. For instance, John 12, verse 7, here in this chapter about the oil... Yeah, the perfume, he replied, leave her alone. She did this in preparation for my burial. You'll always have the poor among you, but you will not always have me. Other times he said, you know what? They criticized him for hanging out with sinners. He said, the healthy people don't need a doctor. And he said, when they, again, they criticized, he told stories of the lost sheep, the lost coin, the lost boy, Luke 15. He said, I've come to seek and to save that which was lost. They said, you're doing this by the power of Satan. And Jesus said, well, that's not really true. I mean, if, think about it. Satan's house is a divided, divided house can't stand. So how do you know when to respond and when not to? And this is tough. You need to ask some questions about it. Is this critic, are they just venting their anger? Or is there really something here for me that I can respond to? Is this the first time we've talked about this? Have we done this 20 times and they just want to rehash it one more time? Is it reasonable? Is it rational? Does it hurt me or does it hurt anybody else? Am I responding objectively? Am I responding in, in anger? When it is necessary to respond to criticism, Sometimes it is. Do so with kindness. The scripture says, a harsh word stirs up anger. A gentle answer turns away wrath. Speak kindly. Here's the most important thing I want to tell you about criticism. Number five, refuse to be sidetracked by criticism. Refuse, know what you're called to do. This is my third week in a row saying the same thing. Know what God has called you to do, and don't let anybody sidetrack you from what God has given you to do. There was a guy in the Old Testament named Nehemiah. He was rebuilding the city wall of Jerusalem, and the critics were abundant. They were nitpicking and nitpicking. They finally sent him a telegram. <laughs> Maybe not quite. They sent him word. Stay with me, would you please? They sent, they sent him a message that said, the, the critics, come on down to the plain of Ono. Is in the place, pl come to the plain of Ono. We want to talk about it. And you know what Nehemiah said? Oh, no. He said, I'm doing a great work for God. I can't come down. I'm not, I'm not going to stop what God called me to do. Just because you don't like what I'm doing. If you don't get your identity from what God calls you to do, you're going to be driven by praise and derailed by criticism. You've got to know what you're called to do. Listen, don't ever let praise go to your head. And don't let criticism go to your heart. You can't please everybody. You've got to please God. Know what he's called you to do. And so the Bible says, 1 Corinthians 15, 58, be steadfast, be immovable, always abounding in the work that God gave you to do, knowing your toil is not in vain in him. Bob Russell, as a preacher, he said this. He said, 98% of my church is great. 2% are nasty. True. That's true everywhere you go. 98% of the people are great. 2% are nasty. But he said this. If I'm not careful, I spend 50% of my time dealing with the 2% who are nasty. And that's a mistake. Don't be derailed by criticism, stay on track. You can expect critics, you can understand them, you can profit from them if you choose to. Respond if you have to, but don't ever get sidetracked by the critic. Happy Father's Day. My dad was a critic. A loving man. He was, he was a great critic. You know, he could always find what I was doing wrong. Anybody else? He was, he was good about it. Mark, if I were you, that was his big phrase. Mark, if I were you, I would do this. And I always said, well, Dad, go ahead. Feel free. He was a great critic, but he's also a great encourager. And with those words that were <clears throat> corrective, that I needed and often didn't abide by, there were also words that he kept teaching me throughout, throughout his life and my life. Mark, you can make this. 
you can be okay. You just got to keep working. I'm, it's Father's Day, and I am grateful for my dad. If you had a dad or have a dad who loved you and sacrificed for you, would drop everything to help you, you ought to be so grateful. If you have a, had a dad or have a dad who is a godly man who pointed you in the direction of Jesus, then you ought to get on your knees and thank God that he gave you a dad like that. Can I give you one word of criticism? Anybody open? Anybody ready? Here, here's my one word of criticism for, you, criticism for you. You are lousy, no good, rotten to the core. How'd that go? I'm telling you, 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 are, you have violated God in such awful ways. You've gone your own direction. You've spat in the face of God, and you deserve hell punishment. You do. Can I give you a word of encouragement? <laughs> because you're so rotten, and God is so good, he sent his own son Jesus to die in your place. So you can be with God forever in heaven. He is, he is such a good father. If you're not following Jesus, you don't have a chance. You need to give your heart and mind and soul and life and all that you have and follow him. Now, if you don't know what I'm talking about, you know how to get that done, then you talk to me. I'll be glad to help point you in his direction. He's a good, good father. He loves you. Let me pray. Father, I want to say thanks for the, for the dads in the house. And it's not an easy job. I pray that you'd help remind the dads today of how important their words are and help these dads of children and grandchildren to keep on pointing them to you. Father, I pray for the dads whose, whose kids have gone a direction that's not great, uh, not your direction. I pray the dads would keep on loving, keep on teaching, keep on setting an example and pointing kids to you and grandkids. Father, thank you for my dad. Thank you for good dads who loved in spite of themselves, in spite of their issues and flaws, who loved us and did the best they could. And Father, I'm thankful for a dad who taught me about you and pointed me your direction. Father, thank you for being the best dad, for being the one we can trust, the one who's always there, who's faithful and reliable, the one who loves every day. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Good morning, ladies and gents. Thanks for coming to church today. We are so glad you're here. I have a few announcements for you guys. High schoolers, we are going to be going on a canoe trip on July 11th through the 14th, and the cost is going to be $90. If you're worried about not being able to pay the cost, talk to Brian or any other youth group leader, and we'll be able to get you hooked up. High schoolers, we're also going on a mission trip in Springfield, Missouri. This is going to be July 25th through the 29th, and the cost of that is going to be $200. Now here's Keaton Whetstone to talk to you guys about the upcoming women's ministry events. Hello everyone, the Women's Ministry has some exciting events coming up and we want to invite you. Obviously, you have to be a lady 18 years or older. Uh, the first two are going to be a prayer and praise. Those will be held on June 26th and July 16th. They will be from 6.30 to 7.30 at the Legion and we hope to see you there. On August 7th, we will be having our next Soul Soil Heart Scan Workshop. Um, as the day gets closer, be on the lookout for more details. Our goal for this ministry is to get into the Word, encourage one another, learn to disciple, and make disciples. We will be using the Multiply app by Francis Chan. We look forward to seeing you. Now here's Michael Marcotte to talk to you about an exciting upcoming seminar. Hey folks, I'm Michael Marcon. I'm one of the co-creators of Not So Secret Bible. And if you've been around the church community for very long, you've probably recognized that the Bible is a pretty important element to what we do. I mean, we preach from it on Sundays, uh, we do Bible studies with it, people carry it around with them, and sometimes they even read it. Uh, the Bible, it's a pretty strange book. If you've ever opened it, uh, you know, there's a talking snake on page three of the Bible. I mean, there's these really strange passages um, and these strange stories that are really far removed from 21st century Mount Carmel. Illinois. But it's our conviction at Not So Secret Bible that the Bible is for everyone and accessible to anyone who reads it, which is why on July 17th at the Legion Building we're going to be hosting a seminar called Reading Responsibly, What is the Bible and How Do I Read It? And at the seminar we're going to be covering topics like the making of the Bible, the Bible is story, and reading the Bible in context. Okay? You know, before Jesus he ascended to, to the Father's side, he said to his disciples, Go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey all that I've commanded you. 
And that's the role that we've taken upon ourselves at Not So Secret Bible is we want to equip the church to read the Bible well, to know Jesus, because it is also our conviction that the Bible is a gift from God so we might know him more, know Jesus more, to know him more fully, to see him more clearly so that we might become the kind of community that he has intended us to be. So the details of the event, again, it's July 17th. It's at the Legion building. It's gonna be from 8 a.m. to 12 p.m. We're gonna have snacks and stuff for you there, snacks and coffee. It's $10 for individuals to sign up and $15 uh, for married couples to sign up. And that's if you sign up by July 4th. Okay, if you sign up after July 4th, there's gonna be a late price and that's $15 for individuals, $20 for married couples. We're really excited about this event. We just wanna help you to read your Bible more effectively so that you might know Jesus more fully. Um, and so we're excited to see you there. So bring a Bible, bring something to write on. Uh, go sign up out in the lobby. One of us will be there to, to walk you through that. And we'll see you there. Alrighty, that's all we got for you guys. I know it was a lot, but have a good day and go hug your dad.